Hello, my name is uh, Pontus Gunve. I am the post-production manager here at Fiesting Graduate School of Cinema. I'm also a music adjunct uh, lecturer. I specialize in music technology. My background is in music and in post-production sound. I'm currently an active musician. I'm a composer. I write my own music, produce my own music, produce for other people as well. I'm also an active sound designer. I worked in many aspects of post-production in the past, uh, just on location as a sound mixer or sound recordist, also post-production mixing. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about some basic things in post-production sound, some things I hope will help you along and just help you understand the process of sound, especially for independent film and for student films. What happens many times is the sound on set or on location often gets sort of pushed to the side and we have unrealistic uh, goals on what we can do with the sound after the fact. So what happens is you may not think about specifics in the room or specific one shooting on location. You may also not think about that you have many opportunities to record the environment you're in when on location. When the camera is shut off and maybe uh, the crew goes for, uh, for lunch or for dinner or for a break, this is a, a very good opportunity for a sound recordist to capture a lot of the sound environments you're in. That's uh, very useful after the fact when you're in post-production, not just what we call the room tone, which is capturing the space you're in, but also other aspects of the sound and the sound you want to capture Sometimes you have to go through sound libraries or try to reproduce these sounds later on and they just don't really fit what you need. So that's why I think it's important as you make your next film or in, in, in the next few projects to think about the sound process really from the beginning. What do you need to capture? I would recommend also this book. His name is David Sonnenschein. It's called Sound Design. It's a very, very comprehensive book on how to think about your sound for visual media and for films. Uh, it's not a, a super long read and it's, it's available on, on Amazon and it's available on multiple bookstores. Uh, it's a good read if you really want to get into sound design and figuring out your sound work as you move along. I also wanted to show you some of the studios here at Fierstein uh, Graduate School of Cinema what we have available to us, and maybe a few microphones so you understand, even not being from sound, what they are and what you can do with them. Uh, first, let's just describe some of the aspects of what post-production sound entails, because there are many different, really, fields. On a bigger production films, you will have a pretty expansive sound team, a sound crew that do specific things, and, and there are many, many, many different fields you can go into. So one that you may be familiar with and one that you may have heard of is the ADR process. This can also be called the looping uh, process or the post-production dubbing process. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. We also have Foley and things that relate to Foley. I'm actually sitting on uh, the Foley stage right now. This is where the Foley work gets done for uh, films at school. We also have sound effects. Many times though when you work in an independent film, these sound effects are usually uh, brought in from sound effects libraries that's been professionally recorded uh, all across the globe. Um, but on a bigger feature and, and if you wanted to really make it your own sound, you should record your own sound effects, and we'll discuss a little bit more about that is. You also have the re-recording mixer, or uh, this is actually also called the, uh, the, the dubbing mixer um, in Britain. This is the final mix. This is the person that does the final mix for your film. So when everything is said and done, you have a dialogue, you have the music, you have the sound uh, design, you have the sound effects, you have all the ADR and Foley and everything put together. They needs to be uh, glued together and combined into one cohesive piece that tells the story you want to tell. And that's really the re-recording mixer. Then we have 
the sound editing process. The sound editing or the sound editor really is responsible for putting a lot of these pieces together. Um, so on a bigger set, this is usually a whole different person and all the other aspects are put in after the fact with a different logic crew. Sometimes what happens in independent film is you have to fill all of these shoes. So it, it's a pretty tall order, but the sound editor is crucial to putting everything together. And then of course we have a sound designer. I would like to think about the sound designer as being slightly more on the creative end of the things. The sound designer is, is what's in charge of developing a lot of sonic textures or maybe the, the specific kind of direction the sound will take in your film. Of course you can do so many things with your film but imagine uh, a film without sound or uh, just tape. the best part I think to become a good sound designer is to both listen to previously made films and, and pay close attention to what's actually drawing you into this film. We're just going to take a look at a couple of different types of microphones. This sort of a different types of class of microphones depending on what you're going to use. Most of the microphones you use on set um, will be as follows. We have a shotgun mic or a boom mic. This is a Sennheiser. The important part about this specific mic is you see that it's kind of long and narrow. This is specifically to capture something that's very directional, something that's very much in front of you. It doesn't capture the ambience around you or not too much of it, but this is designed in such a way that you would point it in one direction and that's where you're gonna capture it. Obviously, the further away a source is, the more of the sounds around it you're going to capture and less of the source. The further the source is from you, meaning if it's an actor and you want the dialogue, you're going to capture much more reflection if they're further away. That's why you want to be as close as possible to capture the closeness of it. This microphone also has a few different switches that's important to note. One is the... Um, Phantom power, it basically is an on button. This is for battery. Phantom power means when you have a condenser type of mic, and this is a class of microphone, a condenser mic, you need a 48 volt power to power this specific microphone. That's something important. A lot of times the battery is out or you're not feeding phantom power from an external unit, and that's why the microphone is not working. On many of these also you have a filter. This is actually a high pass filter, that means if you're in an environment that has a lot of low rumble, you need to take that out. So it's a straight line like this, is no filtering. And if you push it down, it filters out the low end, the low end, so it's traffic or wind or something like that. You will also be familiar with a lavalier mic. It's a small microphone like this that you place on the actor or the talent's body. Um, if you don't worry about it, you just clip it here. You can see it. It's fine. It's for interviews or um, for television presenters, etc. On set, you don't want to show the microphone, so you usually hide it. This is actually a wired lavalier. You also have uh, the wireless. Now, when you're back and doing post production, you will use these two in an ADR situation. I will show you what that looks like. You will also have other types of microphone at your disposal. So this could be possibly for recording sound effects, uh, recording other things, recording narration, etc. So we discussed a condenser mic. This here is also a small diaphragm condenser mic, sometimes called a pencil mic because it's small, narrow, and thin. And you also have a similar set of switches here. You will have a um, a filtering switch, so you can select different filtering options or cut, you basically cut out the frequencies. And you also have what's called a pad. A pad is if your signal is too loud, but you can't lower it on the preamp portion, you can pad down the amount of the microphone. We also have what's called a polar pattern. A polar pattern is where the microphone is picking up. This has two polar patterns. It has an omni, which is all directions, all the way around it. 
and it has a cardioid which is basically in front of it. So this is a pencil mic. This could be used for a Foley session, but oftentimes we actually use a boom mic and a shotgun mic for a Foley session. This is a large diaphragm microphone. In this case, it's an AKG uh, C414. As you can uh, tell, in the front here, we have many different polar patterns. We have about five of them. All together, I believe there are about uh, 10 or so, as you can do these in combination. We have basically have a, an Omni, a wide cardioid, a regular cardioid. We have a figure eight, and we also have sort of a, a hyper or, or, or very narrow cardioid here. In the back, we have pads, and we have, um, we have cut filters. This microphone might be useful if you're doing a voiceover or a narration of some sort, where you don't have to worry about a sounding exactly what you did on set. The reason that we use the shotgun and, and the same lavalier mic that we had on set for an ADR replacement when we're trying to replace the dialogue is so we don't have to spend so much time uh, making these match. We're trying to make sure they sound similar. These microphones often come in a what's called a shock mount. It sits like this. It avoids having vibration transfer from anything on the ground to the microphone itself. So these are some basic types of microphones that you will use on film. The other thing I will show you is you may encounter these dynamic microphones. They're not as useful on post-production sound, but if you only have this, you may use it. A dynamic microphone can handle a higher SPL, which is sound pressure level. So they're very useful for um, a sounds that are very loud, like inside of a kick drum or on top of a snare drum for music, for guitar amps, for those types of, of situations. So if you record music, yes, you will use this dynamic microphone. But when we record dialogue and we record uh, other types of sounds that are more delicate and we want to get more clarity from it, I would avoid using dynamic mics for post sound. But again, if this is all that you have, and this is all you have, and you can make it work. That's the beauty of independent films and student films. You just have to make it work and finish your film. So hopefully it gives you a little bit more on what we do as far as microphones and what you have available. There's a whole range of other kinds of microphones, and obviously we can't d describe them all in this short little segment. Next, let's go into the ADR studio and take a look at a basic setup there. So we have teleported ourselves into the ADR studio. Specifically now, we're going to look at just a few things that we do in ADR. This is the ADR studio portion of it. This is where your talent will be trying to um, replace the lines, uh, usually from on set when it was bad. Uh, and on the other side here, we have the ADR control room where you're working with the engineer, possibly the producer, to make sure that we get the right takes. So ADR stands for Automated Dialogue Replacement. There are many reasons why you would choose to do ADR. Anytime you do an outside shoot, you're most definitely gonna need to replace that dialogue. It's hard to not have inconsistencies. You are not in a, contr in a controlled environment or even an apartment. Anything basically that is not a controlled environment, such as the sound stage or any kind of other studio where you have control of the reflections of the room sound, you are likely to go into an ADR session. Other reasons could be that you need to add a line from an actor that was not recorded on set. You need to basically capture a line that is not quite there. The performance wasn't there. Or maybe you love the way the shot looked, but you just need that line to change uh, the course of the film. There might be reasons why you might want to fix continuity errors or maybe even change a, a minor character's name. And then you have to replace that dialogue after the fact. Oftentimes, animation, the first step is actually having the actors perform out the scenes and then this performance is sliced up and cut up 
and that's what the animators use to animate their film. If you're in a, a big scene, a bar scene with a large crowd uh, surrounding the two main actors, you really don't want their dialogue. You want no other sounds made from the, the extras or the uh, secondary characters that are not on scene. This is a time that you can, in ADR, record some of this after the fact. Another real big reason for an ADR session is if you're sending this to a foreign market. And on that end, you've replaced, you've taken out all the dialogue in that mix, and they're basically overdubbing the entire thing in German, Korean, or any other languages. This is also why you would be in an ADR session. So I'm gonna show you a basic setup and some tips and tricks. So what I have in front of me now is a basic ADR setup. This is probably going to be most of your dialogue replacement types of setups. I have a lavalier mic, um, ideally exactly the kind you were using on production. So usually get in touch with your engineer and figure out what they were using on location. This can be placed anywhere now. We don't really see. Um, the microphone is not a concern. You place this as close as you want or whatever you feel is needed to get the best sound possible as close as to what was recorded on set. Also, we have a boom mic right in front of us. Uh, same thing there. You want to be able to place this uh, exactly uh, where you need for it to capture the best sound. You need a pair of headphones so you can hear back. One very important part that sometimes get missed is we have a stand, a music stand in front of us. This is actually in metal, and it gives a nice ring, which we don't want. For example, if I have an intense scene, and I tend to get a little bit too excited and scream a little bit or get a little louder, it actually reflects, and that's what I don't like. So one quick tip that you can do to soften this is to get some of these large um, paper clip things and actually pad this up. So you basically just put this a soft, uh, uh, any kind of sort of sound dampening material. This is actually packing material. And you can just soften this up. Put these here and these here. And you get, get less of that uh, reflective kind of ping. Remember, there's a little piece on the bottom here where I like to just kind of attach it. And now you get less of that reflection. The way the session would work is you would work with your engineer on the other side, you would work with your director on the other side, or sometimes inside the room as well. You will hear your prior performance. It will be played a few times, maybe on a loop. You will have a beep. It's a 1K signal that basically gives you a cue. You get three of those. Beep, beep, beep. Pause, and then you have the line that needs to be replaced. And that's basically it. Um, I'm going to show you the control room. We have now transported ourselves to the other side of the ADR uh, studio, which is the control room. We are using these Avid S6 control surfaces for um, control of our preamps, uh, our cue system, our talkback, which is very important when to communicate with the, the actor on the other side, the talent. And we use a Genelec speaker system. This is where your engineer will basically record the session, set up the sessions ahead of time. One very important part of ADR is make sure you are set up ahead of time. You don't want your talent to wait for you to get ready with sound check or with setting up microphones or, or all those things. If you need to book the session, book the session at least a half hour beforehand so everything is set up for you so the actor can come in and basically just do the work and get done. So what is the job of a Foley artist and how do we use them in film? Your Foley artist reproduces the everyday sound of a character usually or specific items that are, are important in a film. Usually the specific Foley sounds are relating to a character. And even that character could be an animal, it could be an item, it could be a specific thing. Think about your footsteps and how they're important to bring life to a scene. It just adds some depth and dimension to the scene itself. Without the footsteps, it just feels like there's no weight to this specific character. They don't feel alive. They feel, if you add footsteps in, 
It feels like they're there with you. Something that's very important as well is the rustling. If I make a movement, I hear this, the rustling of the clothes, this plastic, uh, this plastic uh, papery bracelet here. It's part of my character now. If you have a, a, a character with a lot of jewelry, that's also part of the character. So you want to add these things in to, again, give life to this character. We call the Foley, um, the person that creates these sound, we call them a Foley artist or a Foley performer just because of that. They will watch the screen and they will perform or copy exactly what this person does. A Foley artist will actually be in very light clothes, just sort of uh, um, a cotton t-shirt and just boxer shorts or something like that to not uh, give off any other sounds that are not part of that character and you have very you also record very specific sounds that are relatable to a scene so you know placing down a book or, or or utensils or anything else you can imagine so as you can see to make your film come alive for sound you take as many notes as many notes as you can of what are the sounds there and what are the sounds that you need to bring to make this film come alive. So that is really what a Foley artist will do. So this is our uh, Foley stage here. You can see the floors are movable here. We can actually pull them up. And there you go. Gravel. So what we have is our screen and we can do our performance from there. This is the type of microphone we end up using, shotgun mic, just directed towards where what we're recording. If it's uh, footsteps or if it's rustling of clothes, there are different areas of Foley that we really need to capture. What we also do quite often is use a uh, what's called a room mic. So we take this, this is a very fancy mic, it's a Neumann U87 and we place it all the way up in the ceiling. So I'm going to show that to you real quick. So we push the microphone as far up as we can go into the ceiling and this microphone is there to capture the ambience of the room. So if we do an indoor scene for our Foley, this is where we capture our ambience. Okay, I hope you've uh, enjoyed that little tour of the studios here and had a little bit of a better understanding of sound, post-production sound. Obviously, there are way more fields that we're not covering right now. Um, there are areas of sound design, sound creation that we want to think about. The most important part, I think, is to be prepared. Uh, set up your sessions, be ready. Also, to have a vision, well, a sonic vision, a sound vision. Have an idea of what you're actually trying to create. Be aware of all the sounds that are part of your film. This could be even uh, taking a still image of each scene and giving this to a sound designer and say, this is my uh, idea for the film. What types of sounds do you envision being in here? What are the sound elements that you do here? One thing that I usually do when I get a film is turn off the sound and watch it without any sound sort of whatsoever. It's almost like reading a script in a way where you're reading and every single step of the way you try to tell the story from a sonic perspective. And that's why I turn off the sound and I fill in the blanks. I take notes of what I hear without having any sort of preconceived notion of what was there prior. Sometimes an editor or a director will add sound to it, whereas I may not see it fit. So that's what I think is some, some things that you can do to really help you develop a, a really a rich and solid sound design. And think about all the elements that could go in there. Please reach out to me if you have any questions uh, about this, or if you have any questions in the future, how to book studios, I will uh, send a message to our studio manager or how to do other aspects of this. Feel free to reach out to me at any point. I can uh, also lead you in the right direction or connect you with someone. I hope you had a good tour of the studio, so I hope you enjoy the sound process. Good luck!